Welcome to the Australian Institute of International Affairs. My name is Alastair Roth. I'm Executive Director at AWA Victoria. So a very warm welcome to AWA members, uh, especially those joining for the first time, to our other guests, to members of the diplomatic corps joining us, and to members of the press who might be joining. So just the usual uh, brief Zoom housekeeping at the outset. We'll take questions uh, towards the end, but please feel free to type any of your questions in the Q&A tab in the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. We'll get through as many as we can. So today, it's of great pleasure that we can launch our new series of Meet the Ambassador. Former ABC foreign correspondent Jim Middleton will discuss current world, regional and national issues with ambassadors and high commissioners accredited to Australia. And we thought no more fitting place to start than our close friends and neighbours, New Zealand. So it's our great pleasure to be able to host the High Commissioner to New Zealand, Her Excellency Dame Annette King. Dame Annette's been High Commissioner in Canberra since December 2018. Before that, she served as Deputy Leader of the New Zealand Labour Party and Deputy Leader of the Opposition from 2008 to 2011, and again from 2014 to 2017. She was a senior cabinet minister in the fifth Labour government of New Zealand, where her portfolios included health, police, justice, and transport. And our interlocutor today, after a 50-year journalistic career as political reporter and foreign correspondent, Jim Middleton. In the 80s, he was the ABC's North America correspondent based in New York and Washington. From 88 to 2007, ABC's chief political correspondent and later political editor in Canberra, went on to be chief anchor for the Australian network, the ABC's overseas network, and with Sky News. So it is a pleasure to have you both with us. Thank you very much for your time. And Jim, I'll hand straight over to you as the High Commissioner. Alistair, great pleasure to be asked. Welcome everybody, and especially to our first guest, uh, the High Commissioner from New Zealand, uh, Damien King. It's great to be able to talk to you. Uh, Australia and New Zealand have uh, very, very lengthy and very close relationships. That's not to say that we don't have our differences uh, every now and then. And uh, I think uh, as the topic du jour is a little prickly one, I might as well get to that straight away. Uh, your Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern uh, today uh, had a bit of a go at Scott Morrison over the case of a New Zealand born dual citizen woman who has had connections with uh, ISIS Daesh uh, in Syria, recently arrested trying to cross into Turkey uh, and has been stripped recently of her Australian citizenship, even though she traveled to Turkey and to the Middle East, I should say, uh, on an Australian passport. Uh, your Prime Minister said that our Prime Minister was abdicating his responsibility as far as this is concerned. He also said that he would be talking to Jacinda Ardern later on in the day. I understand that discussion has been had. Can you give us a bit of a readout of what it might have transpired in that meeting, whether any agreement has been reached? Well, kia ora everybody, and it's wonderful to be <laughs> the first to meet the ambassadors. And you're quite right that uh, um, our long-standing relationship is very important to both our countries. And so I'm honoured to be the first um, on tonight. Um, I can't give you a very good readout, Jim. I haven't got one myself, but I do know that both our prime ministers spoke this afternoon. Um, although our prime minister has raised this issue with Prime Minister Morrison um, um, from around about July 2019. Um, and it is an issue she feels strongly about. Um, and I can't tell you the outcome of, of the meeting, although I heard it, it was um, a positive um, meeting. This is a, uh, this issue, not just this one, but others as well, have been a considerable irritant for some time. Now, the fact that uh, discussions about this go back as far as uh, 2019 uh, would suggest that not a lot of progress on the subject is being made. It's, it's all to do with Australian legislation in terms of um, cancelling dual citizenship, the, the citizenship of the other country, and, um, and the issue of, of whether, um, whether it should be cancelled in the case of, of this particular person 
who spent uh, most of her life in Australia, um, leaving New Zealand when she was six years old. So the, the argument be, being that um, she has all her connections in Australia, none in New Zealand, and that um, cancelling uh, her citizenship uh, leaves uh, New Zealand in a difficult position, which our Prime Minister has expressed strongly and, and will continue to express. And we can do that because we are good friends. And when issues arise, uh, we will uh, front them um, to, to the uh, government of the day, and they do the same to us. So that's what good friends can do um, without any lasting damage. Are you able to tell us any more about the background relating to this woman, if it's uh, now no. two years or so that no. you have been aware only of the predicament? Only what you've read in the media, Jim, and, mm -hmm. uh, and the media will say that this is a, a woman who left Australia on an Australian passport as a dual citizen who, who um, went over to Syria. Um, she um, ob obviously became involved with ISIS, um, had uh, two, she's got two children, very young children, which are obviously of concern, um, and has presented herself uh, wishing to return. Are the children Australian citizens? Oh, that's a very good point. I suspect they are because they were born in Australia to an Australian citizen. Indeed. Now, one other thing about this does, pardon my ignorance, but does New Zealand have any similar legislation in place which enables citizens, dual citizens to be stripped of, uh, of, of, their, uh, of their local citizenship? Yes, we can strip citizenship, but we will, we will not make a person stateless. So if some other country has stripped them of their citizenship and they remain with a New Zealand citizenship, we would not strip them of that citizenship. But of course, most countries have the ability to be able to remove citizenship from, from people who have, have done things that don't warrant them or they don't deserve citizenship. Now, look, one other point, I don't want to trivialise the seriousness of, of this case, in particular, the situation where there are two small children involved, but this, has, this general issue has been a considerable irritant in relations for quite some time. I think, for example, of the Australian star footballer, Dustin Martin, his father, who has uh, not allowed to come to Australia because of bad character, uh, for example. But is there a certain convenience in this in that uh, it enables uh, Scott Morrison to parade his national security credentials? And on the other hand, from my experience, and this goes back a very long way, High Commissioner, a, a bit of Australian Aussie bashing doesn't, uh, goes quite a long way in New Zealand. <laughs> I, I'm, I hope we're getting over that. You know, we, it is it is 40 years since the underarm uh, incident. So, um, but I can't possibly speak for uh, Prime Minister Morrison's um, uh, motivations. Um, but but what I can say is that we have an extremely good relationship with Australia on just about every issue, and and we coordinate and work extremely well. And if there is a rub point, it is around the treatment of New Zealanders. Uh, who have been who live in Australia, and many of them have been here for most of their lives. And mm -hmm. the uh, the ability for them to get citizenship, the ability to access services which Australians can access in New Zealand, is an issue that we raise uh, whenever we we meet our prime ministers meet or our officials meet. It is an issue that we pursue, uh, wanting to get back to some of the reciprocity we had between our two countries on these issues going back to 2001. Talking about reciprocity in another area, one of the other matters of concern quite often between prime ministers when they meet and between Australia and New Zealand in general is reciprocity of benefits and opportunities for New Zealanders in Australia and Australians in New Zealand. One particular issue I understand uh, is this of the National Disability Insurance Scheme in Australia. Uh, I think I'm right that New Zealand is in Australia, a lot of them can access the benefits of the NDIS, but there's a particular question for children under the age of 10. Am I right? What's the problem? Yes, and what, what, what are you well, doing about it? Well, New Zealanders, in fact, can't 
access the NDIS, um, but children can once they reach the age of 10. Although New Zealanders working in Australia paying taxes and paying the NDIS levy. And so we have argued for some time uh, with, with uh, the Australian government that um, they, we ought to, they ought to be covering children who are in New Zealand, uh, from New Zealand, because a child who has a disability can't wait till they're 10 years old to get assistance from the state. Um, and so it is something our Prime Minister raised uh, last year um, with the Prime Minister of, of Australia wanting to talk about, can we do more for children who are um, in Australia? We work on the, the citizenship issues, the, the benefit issues, and, and um, we know that they are difficult issues for the Australian government, but we would really like to see some movement, particularly for children who are, who are born in, in Australia to New Zealand parents. And of course, it is a very difficult point if you are born with a disabled child, in some ways the, the greatest burden, uh, in fact, is in those early years where you're trying to get diagnosis, where you're trying to get the support that you need at a, at a time where you're probably not as financially well off as you may be later on uh, in their childhood and when you're caring for them. It, it, what is the situation in terms of how active are your discussions uh, with uh, Minister Stuart Robert and his department uh, about this subject and how optimistic are you that it may be resolved? Well, we're always optimistic because um, <laughs> because you, you, we haven't closed the door on, on any of these issues. So whenever we can, we raise them. And when our prime ministers meet, once, once we can once uh, again meet in person, but even even with a virtual meeting. These issues will be on the agenda and have been um, for a long time from the previous uh, government in New Zealand under John Key. They go back a long time. And so we raised them. We had um, a review um, undertaken by the Australian government looking at some minor shifts and changes in the, uh, the length of time New Zealanders wait to, to be able to apply for citizenship. But we, we are told there'll be another review by 2022 and we will continue advocating. In the end though, Jim, these decisions are of a sovereign government and they have the right to make these decisions. Um, and, and we don't argue that they don't. We just say as good friends and neighbors who, if you recall, and Jim, I know that uh, you've, you came from New Zealand originally, you will know that you probably traveled to Australia without a passport. Quite Such so. was our relationship back then, and I can remember it. And our, over time, of course, things things do change. But but we want to uh, keep building on the relationship, and where we can get wins in this particular people to people uh, area, uh, we we try very hard. In general, in the, in the general question of reciprocity in these areas, seeing as it is such a sore point, it is raised, as you say, by New Zealand prime ministers and not just Jacinda Ardern, John Key before her and, 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 and other prime ministers as well. Do you think that in general, the, the atmosphere and the results are improving for New Zealanders over time or is it still very much up in the air and the, 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 the core concerns uh, remain? The core concerns remain. Um, as I said, there was a review and, and a agreement for some slight change. But unfortunately, the ch changes that were made in 2001 and there were then changes in 2016, each of those changes has disadvantaged New Zealanders uh, here in Australia. And, you know, there's something like 700,000 New Zealanders living in Australia, about 80,000 Australians live in New Zealand. So on a head of population basis, it's about the same percentage. But, but so, so um, I can't say that um, we've made huge progress, but that doesn't mean that we won't try. And it doesn't mean it's the, every, it's the only thing in our relationship. It certainly is not. And in so many other areas, um, you know, we, we really uh, work incredibly well together. Another issue in the news, of course, which is a matter of mutual concern, is the Pacific and what's happening with the Pacific Islands Forum at the moment. New Zealand has an even more special relationship with the Pacific than Australia does. The Polynesian links in particular are very, very strong. 
Uh, how serious is this rift in New Zealand's point of view? Something similar has happened before and then came back together again. And what are you doing immediately to try to repair the damage and get people talking to other, each other and getting the thing back on track? Yes, for those that aren't aware, um, at the recent uh, meeting, um, they voted in a new Secretary General for the, the Pacific Island Forum. Uh, the person who was voted in was a former Premier of the Cook Islands, uh, Henry Puna. Um, uh, um, unfortunately, the, the Micronesian Islands were upset by that decision. Uh, they, they believed it was a tur the turn of their nations to be uh, in the chair. Um, and, um, and so they have said that they intend to leave the Pacific Island Forum. We, we ha do have a very good relationship in the Pacific, as you probably know, that Auckland is the biggest Pacific Island city in the world. Our, our relationship is predominantly with Polynesia, with Tonga, uh, with Samoa, the wrong countries of, of the Cooks and Nua and Tokelau. But we do have good relationships with, with the other island nations. And our Minister of Foreign Affairs, our new minister, um, the Honourable um, Nanaya Mahuta, has certainly been talking and wanting to bring people together to look at how we could resolve this and, and for them uh, to get back to working together. And um, I think it's a year before they actually, uh, the, the islands, the Micronesian islands actually leave the PIF. And I hope in that time, there's the, the ability to pull them back together because it's so important that we, uh, we work together in this part of the world. Um, so certainly we will, we will be using what, whatever influence we have. Um, and also, of course, Australia has a big influence in, this, in the area as well, particularly in the Solomons and Vanuatu and uh, PNG and so on. So I think we all have to uh, work together to see if we can um, make sure that it comes back together for the benefit of all, all the islands. Does New Zealand have some sympathy for the viewpoint of the Micronesians? Uh, I know, you know the Polynesian connection is strong and uh, Henry Puna comes from the Cooks, but does New Zealand see that Microne the Micronesians might have had a point? I think there is a point, um, but, but um, I think the argument has been that it's not on a rotational basis, that it's more on the, per the person that the, um, the nations who voted believe could do the best job. And both Australia and New Zealand, we, we, we do not in interfere in this. We obviously are, are, are partners, um, but we, would, we like the island nations to be able to, amongst themselves, to come to, to a consensus on, on who should lead and, and on many other issues actually. So, so you know, there is a point um, because uh, and Micronesia believe that they, it's their turn, but I'm told that it's not a rotational issue. Look, uh, the Pacific is an increasingly important part of the world, uh, no doubt about it. It's, it's, it's now the cockpit of an increasing contest between the United States and China. The vast waters of the Pacific are very, very important strategically. With schisms of this kind, does it worry New Zealand that this does make it harder to maintain the traditional relationships uh, that the Pacific Islands have enjoyed with New Zealand and with Australia, and also indeed with the United States? Do you worry that the Micronesians in particular have shown skittishness in the past, uh, might well look elsewhere for the very substantial support that all their economies require, uh, and particularly now that we have the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Well, we, we are very focused on us uh, uh, taking a united approach uh, um, on, on most issues in our region uh, with like-minded countries. Um, you know, we, we very much support an international rules-based approach and, and international institutions. Um, we, we put a lot of effort, both Australia and New Zealand, into supporting the Pacific. Um, and we, we recognise that the, uh, the Pacific Islands have the right to make their own decisions. But it's also, uh, uh, we have a responsibility to where we can work alongside them to do just that. And so I've, I've not ruled out that, that this, this, um, this uh, problem that has emerged cannot be resolved. 
um, and it, it may take some work, um, but I think there's a lot of goodwill to try and resolve it. Look, I might come back to uh, broader relationships in the Pacific a little bit later on, but it, it would be remiss of me in current circumstances if I didn't look at uh, Australia-New Zealand relations in the context of COVID. Been a lot of praise for the way in which New Zealand has handled uh, the pandemic and indeed uh, quite a bit too uh, for Australia. Uh, but as we have seen, hopes for the trans Tasman bubble, the Australia-New Zealand bubble, uh, really are struggling while we do have uh, individual outbreaks as we currently are currently having in Victoria, problems in New South Wales over Christmas, Western Australia, Queensland as well, outbreak in, in Auckland too. Uh, what, uh, how confident is New Zealand that uh, we will be able to get to a point of stability and agreement where the bubble can actually work on a permanent basis rather than this turning the switch on and off uh, every time there's a problem on one side of the Tasman or the other? Look, it's the question I'm asked just about every day. Uh, you know, people are saying, you know, have bubble, will travel. Um, <laughs> and where else can we travel but between our two countries? And we are very keen for that to happen. And so, so is Australia because, you know, there's so much that we can do with each other, particularly in the area of tourism. Uh, it's, it's our number one export. It's a big, a big issue for Australia as well. We're keen to get it up and going, but, but it is um, a truth that the virus is a very tricky virus and we've had to learn a lot in this year. And if you think back, um, I mean, last year and now into this year, but if you think back to when the outbreak occurred and how little we knew about it, uh, mm -hmm. how we needed to manage it, how, how would a federation manage it? Because as you know, we are, we are one country and we don't have uh, the benefits or the disadvantages of federation. And so we've had officials working on a, um, a, a two-way trans-Tasman bubble now for many months. And the issues are pretty much resolved and, and pretty much ready to go. But what, what I think has, uh, has happened, and you've mentioned it, Jim, along the way, we've had outbreaks and we're learning especially with this, this new virulent uh, virus uh, strain, uh, what do we need to do to manage it? And so I think we have grown more confident with each other's ability to manage it. Um, we have a lot of interaction between our health officials, between our border officials, and at a political level. And I, at this point, would just want to say how much assistance that we have had from, from the top down, for example, uh, Minister Greg Hunt rings and texts me on a regular basis to tell me what's happening. We have our chief health uh, advisors in both countries um, talk regularly, and we do have a representative on the a AHPPC. So, so we are working to make sure that we both keep our countries as safe as we can as we learn um, to manage this virus. I think we've we've learned to trust each other, and I'm not going to put a date on it, but. <laughs> I am very, I am very hopeful that um, that the minister of of uh, COVID in New Zealand, who is still saying by the end of March um, that that'll that'll happen, and I think there is good will on both sides for it to happen. So, is it really just a matter? It's hard enough in Australia to get agreement between uh, the states, the Commonwealth, and the territories on anything, and we've seen that uh, right throughout COVID bringing New Zealand as well. Is it a matter of New Zealand being confident that the, that the regime in place in Australia, throughout Australia, is as good as what you have in New Zealand and is successful, and therefore that you can contain outbreaks so that it may not jeopardise the bubble itself? It's both ways, Jim. It's, it's not a matter of us being confident in Australia. It's Australia being confident in, in us as well, because you'll know that the Green Lane was closed a few a week or two ago. Um, we, so that New Zealanders coming in without having to quarantine was closed when there was an outbreak in Northland. So, so it's, it's both ways. Um, and I think we, we are, have learned to, to trust each other on how we manage it. What, one of the complications for New Zealand has been that 
you do have states and territories and they handle things in different ways. And what we need really needed to know was what would happen if there was an outbreak in this state, what would everybody else do? And I think we're learning as we go because we've now seen WA, we've seen South Australia, we've seen what happens in Victoria and Queensland. And of course, we've seen the way that New South Wales manages it. So, so I, I think we're close to, to, uh, to an opening. There'll always be the opportunity, of course, if there is an outbreak and they need to, they need to uh, close things down to get on top of it. That will happen, and and that until we are all vaccinated or as many as possible, I think that's that, that will occur. But it's how we manage it, how we go about it. It's, look, look, this is a very, very important issue because the global economic environment in the post-COVID world is going to be significantly different from what it was before. Australia and New Zealand, both trading nations, we depend on trade for our prosperity, our well-being. Uh, what I'm wondering is this, that uh, how much more significant do you think or hope the economic relationship between Australia and New Zealand, which is very, very substantial indeed, uh, will, will be uh, in the, in, in the post-pandemic environment? I think it, it already is, but in the post-pandemic environment, it will be even more important. Um, because our two, our two countries have the most enduring free trade arrangement of any in the world, um, CER that was signed up in 1983. And, and 17 years ago, it, it was turned into the single economic market. And we, even through the pandemic, have been building on that in ways that we can keep trading to keep the supply chain open between us uh, to keep uh, business investment going, and that's been happening. Um, and because, because we, can, uh, we can trade and work with each other, because we've streamlined and we have so many things in common in the way we work, um, we've been able to keep our economies going between the two of us. But going forward, there are huge opportunities. And one of the really important pieces of, of architecture we have between us is the Australian New Zealand Leadership Forum, which is made up of, of businesses on both sides of the Tasman, and, and they meet. Uh, we used to meet twice a year, been a bit harder uh, in COVID, but we're due to meet in October, where we bring businesses and ministers on both sides of the Tasman together to look at ways that we can make uh, the doing business between our countries uh, even better, and and then then in time to look out how we could expand uh, CER, if you like to other like-minded countries in our, in our region. So it is important. You, you know, New Zealand adds the equivalent of another, another WA to Australia's economy. So, so uh, we, we are important to Australia, but Australia is very important to us, particularly in that sink, small and medium uh, business uh, area where so many of Australian businesses uh, operate out of New Zealand. And certainly in investment, Australia investment into New Zealand is, is very important and growing. Uh, our Prime Minister likes to state the importance of small business to the Australian economy. Indeed, so does our opposition leader as well. Uh, I, I, th I think there is, you have some interesting facts as far as the small business relation across the Tasman goes, that it is much, much more significant than perhaps, and cert well, certainly than most Australians Realise. I wonder whether you could just uh, fill us in a bit as, uh, about the small business relationship. For small and medium-sized businesses in Australia, New Zealand is the, the biggest market. And people often think that the biggest market comes out of China. In fact, uh, for small and medium-sized businesses, it's New Zealand. And so, Jim, that, it, it, we, we do provide a great opportunity for small business to... Uh, to be involved, but also Australia provides the same for New Zealand. And uh, we have a lot of New Zealand, particularly in that food and beverage space. Um, of course, Fonterra is here in, in, a, in Australia. So that's a big business and, and um, I'm not counting them, but, but yes, Australia um, for small and medium businesses, uh, they find the New Zealand market uh, much easier to, to, uh, to be in. 
it's a good stepping stone for both our countries to start our business, small businesses in each other's country before we even look to, to go into larger countries for trading and export. Are there particular sectors uh, which for Australian business in New Zealand should be providing greater opportunity or perhaps on the other side, create challenges which uh, would be better they were not there? Well, there are many opportunities and, and, you know, New Zealand and perhaps a lot of Australians don't know this, that we have quite a developing space industry in New Zealand. We are actually sending uh, satellites up in the United States out of New Zealand. So in, in that high tech area, but also in food and beverage, um, you know, a lot of, of, of food out of Australia and, and, and uh, wine and, uh, um, and, and beverages. <laughs> Uh, are loved in New Zealand and there's, there's huge opportunities in that area. Of course, there is in tourism and the tourism businesses um, uh, and, and assistance to tourism business in, in New Zealand is a great opportunity because as I said, it is our biggest, uh, our biggest export. Um, there's, there's, so there's lots of different opportunities. A new one that's emerged is in the defense space. Um, as you are aware, Australia is investing 270 billion into um, defence procurement um, and uh, New Zealand has the ability to bid into that market because we are part of CER and we, we can bid into, into um, not we don't build ships or tanks as you know, but we, we do have technology and, and a lot of very talented people who can bid into the Australian market in, in the building of of, the, of, of frigates, for example, or in some of the um, new army, army uh, machinery, but also Australian businesses can bid into the New Zealand defence market. And this is a growing area um, of, of uh, working together. Tourism, you mentioned tourism. Australia, New Zealand's biggest export, pan, the pandemic, of course, has basically ended that. How serious a problem is that for the New Zealand economy? How readily do you think uh, you can pick up the slack by encouraging more Australians uh, to, uh, to, visit, to, to visit New Zealand? Is that actively being pursued? Well, it would certainly help. And, and uh, I meet a lot of Australians in this job and perhaps because there'll be nowhere else to go in the world that I hear on a daily basis, when the bubble opens, we're going to New Zealand. Um, but no, um, tourism has been badly affected in New Zealand. Unfortunately, um, tourists from Australia would not be enough to fill the gap that has been left by, by uh, the pandemic closing the border. Um, you know, it, it is a, a problem for us and one that we've looked at in terms of what can we do with domestic tourism. And, and one of the things that has happened in New Zealand, and I notice also, also in Australia that that our own people are actually going out and looking at their own country. Um, we often were, were heading overseas to look at other people's countries before we saw our own. So there's been uh, there's been an emphasis on, on um, domestic tourism. But uh, the thing that will really matter is the opening of borders again for international uh, tourists. It may well be that we, we chase a different tourist market to what we've done in the past, uh, longer stays, uh, higher value, if you like. Um, one of, but one of the really good things that has happened during this uh, pandemic is Tourism New Zealand and Tourism Australia organisations have been working together. It's not something that they've done in the past, but they've decided to, that they would work and cooperate together. Um, and of course they are in competition for tourists, but recognising at this point it is to the benefit of both of us if they work together on, on how we sell each other's country. Uh, I'll come to some questions from the audience a little bit later, but there's some popped up on my screen here and one that's um, caught my attention and it does relate to trade is this, which is uh, that, uh, uh, what thoughts might you have on, now that we're seeing Brexit underway uh, in, in, in the UK and the realities of that uh, starting to hit home, any thoughts on, a, on, a, on Australia New, New Zealand free trade agreement with the UK or does that look a bit much like the old empire preference uh, which got us in <laughs> both countries, New Zealand in particular, 
into a heck of a lot, a heck of, a lot of trouble in the 60s and 70s. We, uh, both of our countries are pursuing um, a free trade deal with the UK and also with the EU. Um, now, Brexit, Brexit has taken place um, and uh, obviously until it happened, we could not formally negotiate with the UK, but, but negotiations are well underway. But also the UK has expressed an interest in joining the CPTPP, um, as you know, it's the, it's the uh, trade deal we have in our region, and uh, they have expressed an interest in, in joining it. So it may be that we end up with the UK as part of the bigger trade deal that we've already, Australia, New Zealand, and others have already signed up to. Talking about the TPP, uh, high hopes, I would imagine, now for the United States to rejoin the Trans Pacific Partnership now that. Um, Joe Biden's in office and Donald Trump has left? Well, I think, I think the discussions will be taking place um, by countries that are part of the TTP and saying, you know, um, this is a really important, an important part of, of not only trading, but of architecture that, that works together for the international good. Um, and, and I think that uh, Joe Biden um, will be very careful in, in terms of, of what steps he take. He's got a lot of things on his plate, but tra obviously trade is a big issue. And um, there is interest, I'm sure, in, in looking at the trade deals that are out there. Um, but I don't, I don't expect, and this is my own personal view, that it'll be the top item of the agenda for the, for the Biden government. But I, I am pleased that, that um, the US has shown an interest um, in positive engagement with the WTO um, and, and, and have also just recently agreed to the new Director General um, who, who, who was um, confirmed, I think, today. Um, so they've also, as you know, re-engaged in the WHO and with the Paris Agreement. And they're all positive things in terms of those, those um, international organisations. Uh, look, speaking about uh, international organisations and so on and so forth, I, I noticed that in her inaugural speech to the, uh, the New Zealand Diplomatic Corps, Minister Mahuta was very keen to stress multilateralism and a rules-based order. Yes. Uh, this is something that both Australia and New Zealand share a very common interest in. Do, you see signs, does New Zealand see signs that the Biden administration will become, or will be more eager uh, to follow that path than the somewhat disastrous unilateralism that we've seen over the past four years? Yes, uh, I mean, even before um, Joe Biden was, was elected, he said that he would be uh, joining the, rejoining the Paris Accord he said uh, that they would be rejoining the WHO and already they have done, he has announced that. And so, um, and he has also expressed uh, the United States commitment to multilateralism and to, and into uh, an international rules-based approach. We are very pleased with that. That is that are bedrock issues for New Zealand, bedrock for Australia um, and for a small trading nation um, at the bottom of the world, we rely on those organizations. And we've always been a player in them. I mean, going right back to the UN, our Prime Minister of the day, Peter Fraser, was right there at the setting up of the UN. And we've been engaged in, in, in all UN um, activities um, as a small nation because we see the value in being involved and being involved with, with other nations in a place where you can, you can talk and work out issues. So, um, you know, I think it, it, it augurs well that already uh, there is the reconnection with, with uh, particularly the, the WHO, which is for its fault, and everyone said there's things they can do better, but uh, it's a very important organisation, particularly now with, with the, this virus that's affecting the whole world. Sticking with this subject, I'm just going to ask you one more question before I go to questions from the audience. I've got quite a few already up on my screen, and this is the thorny question of China. So it does relate to both Australia and New Zealand, but also to Joe Biden, who one thing he does seem to have indicated is that the fairly uh, strenuous 
uh, US policy towards China will not go away. We're already seeing the assertiveness of China in the Pacific express itself in various ways. Most recently, for example, this idea of setting up some kind of Shenzhen on the Torres Strait, um, just uh, at, at, the, at the bottom of Papua New Guinea, only inches almost away from the Australia's border with, um, uh, with Papua New Guinea. Just how concerned uh, is New Zealand about uh, the increasing assertiveness and indeed aggressiveness on occasions of, of China in the Pacific? Oh, we, I think like most nations, um, are, are concerned and we, but also we, we do have um, a, a relationship with, with China that is, is spanning many sectors, you know, the economy and, and society and they are our largest trading partner, but um, New Zealand and China have very different histories and, and different political systems. And it's expected that uh, there are issues that we will um, take a very different view on. And so, so we uh, try to focus on a mature relationship with them uh, that uh, recognizes the opportunity to work together on interests that, that are aligned, um, such as um, climate change. But we also address those political issues um, and security issues where we have differences. And so, um, you know, you, you would expect us as a sovereign nation to, to, um, to carry out our foreign relations uh, on behalf of New Zealand and that, that we would, um, where we disagree with the actions of any country, but including China, we would be ensuring that we let them know what we thought. One more question on this subject. I noticed that uh, your senior ministry officials are still talking to their counterparts in China. Australia can't do it at that level, let alone at ministerial level. It hasn't been that way for a number of years now. What are you doing right in New Zealand that we're doing wrong? I couldn't possibly comment on Australia, Australia's um, foreign policy. That is very much up for Australia. But as I said, we, we focus, we do focus on um, a mature relationship with and looking for opportunities to work together. But also um, we, we uh, do encourage uh, China to, to act responsibly in support of, of uh, you know, an international rules-based order. Um, so so we, we do our thing, um, other countries do theirs. Uh, it doesn't mean that we will always agree um, and, and the, the main thing is to, to work on, uh, on um, our relationship when, when we are in alignment. And um, that, that is the way that we, we address it. And, and, you know, it's very much up to Australia how they address uh, their foreign policy, as any country does. Fair enough. Look, we might come to some, um, some uh, questions from... Uh, the audience that have, uh, a very keen audience that have uh, come in over the past uh, 40 minutes. Uh, and look, uh, the one issue that I haven't touched on uh, really is climate change. It is, uh, you, you are very lucky not to have the rancorous debate that we've been having for the last two decades here, but you do have your own problems. Agriculture, 50% of, um, of emissions is, uh, is, is something of an issue if you're going to get to net zero by 2050. We've got a question here from um, Anne-Marie Schlack, who says, New Zealand and the South Pacific Island countries are trying to mitigate climate change impacts and actively pursue Paris Agreement goals. Will Australia's more reluctant approach to climate change issues have an impact on cooperation with New Zealand and the Pacific? Yeah, um, I think the short answer is no. Each country is managing uh, their climate change um, in the way that they can. Um, we have a different profile. You've already mentioned um, our problem is greenhouse gas, um, domestic greenhouse gas emissions, particularly the biogenic met methane. And, and so, so we, we will concentrate on doing what we need to. And, and you know, as, as I've said, we are very much engaged um, with the, the, the Paris Agreement. We've done quite a number of things. And I think one of the things that is working well for us is that we got um, climate change legislation change in um, 2019, which set up, it was a bipartisan approach. So across the parliament in New Zealand, 
there is a bipartisan approach to, to climate change. And, and uh, the new legislation is providing us with, with a framework for us to, to implement um, what are pretty clear and stable climate change policies. And so, so I could run through what the Act does, but I don't know whether we've got time, but, it's, but one of the things it has done is established a new independent climate change commission. And this commission is there to provide expert advice and monitoring of successive governments as to making sure they're keeping on track, meeting our long-term goals. Also, we do have an emission trading scheme um, in New Zealand. Um, and so that gives us um, a framework for pricing. Um, and it gives us a framework for pricing um, agricultural emissions. And so, I mean, there was some talk that, um, in fact, New Zealand had exempted agriculture from our domestic targets. That is not quite correct. Uh, there is a legislated target to reduce emissions of biogenic methane to, uh, to 24 to 47% below the 2017 levels by 2050, um, including a 10% uh, below uh, the 2017 level by 2030. But all the other greenhouse gases um, uh, have a net zero target by 2050. Um, and so it's rather, it's rather complicated, but what is, uh, I think has been really, really um, positive is that, um, that industry, the farming industry in New Zealand, working with the government to come, across, to come together to agree on a framework for pricing agricultural emissions in the future. And so coming to the table um, are the agricultural players and the government, and that's, that's um, going to be very important so that we can, by 2025, agricultural emissions can be part of our emissions trading scheme. Very, but very but also we have been the champions of, of research, agricultural research in measuring and reducing emissions. Uh, it's it's, um, it's a, lot, a lot of effort in New Zealand going into how we can reduce those emissions, which are our problem. Australia has a different profile to us, and it's, you know, it's very much up to Australia how how they go about it. Um, it, it's, it is really encouraging to see that it's at the top of the agenda for the United States. And obviously you mentioned, Jim, it is very important to the Pacific, uh, the Pacific Islands and is always number one item on the P Pacific Island Forum. And in terms of uh, relations with the Pacific for Australia and New Zealand, uh, Australia's rather laggardly approach to this issue uh, how 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 diff how much more difficult has that made uh, managing relations with the Pacific nations, and particularly those that are likely to face inundation? Um, well, that's hard for me to to judge, Jim. I mean, that we know what um, what our relationship is with the with the Pacific nations. Um, Australia does a lot of work in the Pacific. They are very aware of the the needs of the Pacific. Um, they, they also um, uh, signed up to the Bow Declaration um, and they know that we have, to do, we have to do things to reduce the impact of climate change in, in the Pacific. And, um, and you know, the, Australia will manage that in the way that they do um, and we will, we will go about our work. And, um, and in terms of the work we do in the Pacific, because of our um, recent reset policy, and Australia's step up, which which uh, are very much align in, in the work we're doing, um, you know, I, I hold, hold high hope that we will be able to make um, a difference in the Pacific, working alongside Pacific people. This is the 70th anniversary this year of ANZUS. And I've got a question from uh, Derek McDougall. What are the prospects for restoring ANZUS as a three-way relationship? Um, I, I really can't answer that. That's that's a question for uh, a much higher pay grade than mine. Um, it, but you know, ch over time, ch things have things have changed. Uh, th things have there are more there are more players, um, like-minded countries that we that we work with and deal with, um, and and so it, it's um, it's changed from from uh, all those years ago when it was signed. Uh, I, I couldn't say whether there is any chance of restoring it, but we have a very good, very good relationship with the US. 
And of course, we have an even better one with Australia because you are our only ally. Well, I think it's, uh, not to put it too bluntly, uh, New Zealand couldn't defend itself without the support of Australia and New Zealand should it ever come to it. Isn't that a fact? Well, I think it's a, I think we would never want it to come to that. Um, right. And and we can we contribute in the in the way that we can, Jim. Um, we are not a, um, a nation that has a lot of resource that can go into defence, but we do a lot with Australia. Um, uh, there's there's increasing compatibility between our our software and our hardware, if you like. Um, we have just uh, purchasing um, some new P8s so that we can be of greater uh, help in the Pacific, particularly around illegal fishing and, and issues like that. But but New Zealand, New Zealand, even in any um, theatre of war, we've been have never gone in on our own. We we certainly believe that uh, that the United Nations is the right body. Um, for uh, us to ever enter any uh, arena of conflict. Uh, related subject, uh, one of Joe Biden's uh, senior China hands, I think it was Kurt Campbell, but it may not have been, was suggesting that Five Eyes could well be, after NATO, the most important alliance relationship that the United States has under the Biden administration. I do notice that on uh, one issue, at least with Hong Kong, where there were four of the five signatories about China's behaviour in relation to Hong Kong. New Zealand was not, wasn't always the case, hasn't always been the case, but on this one it was. Got a question from Patrick Moore, who's asking, how important is New Zealand's involvement in Five Eyes in the view of New Zealanders? Well, I think most New Zealanders and most Australians don't know what Five Eyes are, so it's only it's only some of us who uh, take a particular um, notice of it. But it is very important uh, to New Zealand, um, and we we are we are very pleased to be part of the Five Eyes arrangement. Of course, it it has been predominantly one of, of intelligence, uh, but but over time it has morphed into a greater participation in other issues. Um, we we uh, we make our own decisions as to when we will join um, statements, as you've mentioned, Jim. Uh, we we put out a statement on Hong Kong a bit earlier. The last one, um, our, our our Minister of Foreign Affairs actually uh, put out a tweet. We weren't part of of a of a press statement, and we we will continue to to decide when um, what we will be attached to and not every Five Eyes country attaches themselves to every agreement, every statement. Um, but it is very important and we, we've got a part to play. And I think that we have been very reliable partners in the Five Eyes arrangement. And, um, and, you know, we, we will continue to be very uh, positive players in it. And what about that notion of, uh, Five Eyes being, the single most important alliance relationship the United States has after NATO. Where does New Zealand stand on that? I, I wouldn't know. I, I mean, that's that, that's the American view, um, and I'm I'm not sure um, whether that's the same view of Australia and New Zealand. Um, but it is a very important arrangement. Um, but it's but also increasingly we are looking to work with like-minded countries in our own own um, Indo-Pacific region and. You know, these are, we have a lot uh, in common in working with with Japan, and the U, the UK is increasingly um, looking to once again engage back down in our part of the world. The French, um, you know, there's there's interest from from the the Chinese. And then then we're looking around the other nations, uh, the Indians, and so on. That that we build good relationships with with like-minded countries that um, that that hold the same values as as we do. Be remiss of me not to get to the end of this without talking about Indigenous relations. We've got a question from Derek McDougall who's asking, what is the official status of Aotearoa as a name in New Zealand? What can Australia learn from New Zealand's approach to settler Indigenous relations and vice versa? Well, I, I, I've been coming to Australia for, for over 50 years and, and I have noticed in this last 10 years 
the efforts that are now being made to recognise the Indigenous people of Australia, which never happened before. It's small steps and welcome steps. And one of the things that I think will be really will be really helpful is um, an, um, an Indigenous um, cooperation agreement that was signed between Minister Ken Wyatt and Minister Nanaya Mahuta on the 28th of February last year for us to work together and learn from each other on Indigenous issues, cultural, social, and economic. Um, and, and, you know, that, that, that I think is, I think it's a first in the world, this, this sort of uh, uh, bilateral agreement on Indigenous issues. Um, and work's already underway um, at officials level to, to turn it into something concrete. But New Zealand has a different history, Jim, as you know, we were settled by a treaty. There was a lot of dishonouring of that treaty. Um, there was a lot of angst and, and um, in New Zealand for many, many years. And it wasn't until the 1970s where you started to see the recognition that this treaty was very important. It's now considered the founding document of New Zealand. And the treaty itself is now a part of our constitutional arrangements. And also the growing recognition that New Zealand is a bicultural nation that um, Māori is an official language of New Zealand, that increasingly our, our children and young people speak Māori, um, and, and there's a pride in that. But we've still got disparities. We've still got a long way to go. Um, but I think what has changed in New Zealand, and, and if you think back to this 50s and 60s when you might have been there, the difference if you went to New Zealand today um, is, is positive. But as, you, as they say, we're not there yet. Well, and what about as an economic force as a consequence of uh, some of the things that have happened as a consequence of a more honourable way of uh, understanding the implications of the Treaty of Waitangi? Well, um, in, in, the, uh, in the 19... Oh, sorry. Um, uh, in the, in the uh, Longy government, um, it was decided to take the treaty claims back to 1840 when the treaty was signed. And the, the, treat, the uh, Waitangi Treaty uh, Tribunal had been set up in the 70s and it now was able to look at grievances and claims that Māori had over the actions of, of the British settlers, uh, particularly in, in taking land and so on. And so over this time, with commitment from governments on, on both sides of politics, we have seen um, all but one of the big um, claims by Māori settled. The, what, there's one left in the Ngāpui people in the far north of New Zealand to be settled. But what Māori have done with the settlement money and, and um, assets that they've got, they've turned it into an over 50 billion asset base for themselves. They are major players in our economy. They are involved in all sorts of activities from from fishing and, and, and tourism, uh, hotel ownership, et cetera. So they've turned, they've turned it looking forward and looking ahead as to what they can do with a settlement for the good of, of their people. And that, that's been one of the very positive things. It would be remiss of me on uh, what's only shortly after the 40th anniversary of that notorious uh, underarm mm -hmm. incident not to uh, give you a say on that is just before we close. 40 years ago, a uh, very enthusiastic team of, uh, from your High Commission played the press gallery a week or so ago. Unfortunately, there was another underarm bold. <laughs> Unfortunately, you're still lost. You're gonna to have to wait another 10 years to get revenge. No. Well, it was the 40th anniversary of the, um, the underarm bowling incident. But um, earlier in the year, our, the High Commission um, put together a cricket team um, to play in the um, last man stand social uh, cricket um, they have here in Canberra. And uh, one of our members decided we'd call it the Overarmers. Um, and because of the name, it got media attention. And uh, so then we decided that we would challenge the press gallery in Canberra to play us on the day, the anniversary of the 40th underarm bowling incident. And, and they took up the challenge and they beat us. Um, and they did bowl one ball um, underarm, but it was 
long before we were beaten. Um, we had so much, we had a lot of fun, a lot of laughs. And, you know, it, it was um, it was an incident and, and there'd be many New Zealanders who still think it is, but we decided it was time to bury the hatchet and we will, we will come back each year and challenge an Australian team on that day uh, to have a game of cricket and a good laugh. Well, good luck next year. I personally always thought it was a disgrace and an embarrassment and I was not in a minority in Australia, I'm sure, with that. Our time has run out. Hi, Commissioner, it has been a delight and a pleasure talking to you. And I think I'd better hand you back to uh, Alistair to um, conclude the formalities. Thank you very much from me and Dean, from our audience. Thank um, you, Jim, thoroughly enjoyed it. Thank you, and, and yes, we had, what a way to end sport. We, we couldn't <laughs> overlook that, but Jim, thank you very much for taking us through so many questions in depth. Hi, Commissioner, thank you for, for your time and sharing so many thoughts and insights. I, I wish we could have gone longer. There were still lots of questions. I think we got through a lot. Apologies if we didn't, but um, thank you again both very, very much. It's a great start to the series. Um, the next is in a month time with the, with the British High Commissioner, but what a great start and, and thank you all for participating and we'll see you again soon. So I will sign off from here and thanks again very much, High Commissioner and Jim. Bye. Kira Tato.